making movies is uh, eating a sandwich of shit. And the only thing that gets a little better is as the years go by, you get a little more bread. But the shit's always there. It was very well meaning. Why don't you take out the violence so you can reach a wider audience? That's because I don't want that wider audience. I want the audience for the movie. I come from a country where you didn't make money because you made movies. You lost money because yeah. you made movies. And I was trembling and I was really moved because A, I was happy the movie was being recognized and B, I was not going to jail. Hi guys, it's uh, Ray here from RayNewton.com. I hope you're fitting well. Now before you watch this quick video, please don't make the mistake 99% of people make. What they'll do is they'll watch this video, get all excited about the success traits that they just learned, and then unfortunately do absolutely nothing about it. For the past 20 years, I've been helping people get into that 1% of their chosen field. And at the end of this video, there'll be a link that you can click that will take you through to a website where I've done a load of free videos that will show you how to take advantage of all the success traits that this famous person is speaking about here today. So please make sure you click the link at the end, learn from the success traits and more importantly put them into your business or personal life have an amazing day what's some stuff that aspiring filmmakers can do just to separate themselves from the herd from the noise well i think that be themselves i mean you 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 can be hard to peg some people may like you some people may not like you some people get what you do some others think you're crazy but if you are true to yourself if you only do things that you really believe in and that are personal to you, then, you know, you don't need the approval of anybody else. Really. Right. I mean, that's, that's, in my opinion, what distinguishes not only the great horror filmmakers, but the great filmmakers in general. You know, uh, some people can go through life shooting B-movies and eventually they get discovered, you know, by an audience that caught them at the right time. Some people go all their lives shooting sort of underground little things and they can't find their audience and it's a matter of being true yeah. not trying to be somebody else or have some different type of budget I mean you'll find your audience and your audience will find you Is it for me? What did Cronus achieve for you? Well, that movie changed my life because we were more than the underdog, more than the Dark Horse. We were a movie that nobody wanted to produce, nobody was supporting except my producers in Mexico. And we suddenly were selected for Cannes and, and literally we were all of a sudden one of the most awarded movies in, in Mexican uh, film history. I remember the first time Kronos won the first award, which was a cash award. And before that award, we were in debt for half a million. I won, we won the award and literally, like, like a beauty contest, I was crying, mm. crying in the stage, holding this giant check. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was trembling and I was really moved because A, I was happy the movie was being recognized and B, I was not going to jail. I come from a country where you didn't make money because you made movies. You lost money because yeah. you made movies. And all of my life, uh, when I approach a, a new project, and I'm 50, 50 years old, and I've done now, I don't know how many movies as producer, director, blah, blah, blah. And I still have the same emotion when I go into a project. I go, how much am I willing to lose to do that image? And there's always one or two images in every project that you would mortgage your house, sell your car, give everything you have to, to make sure that image comes uh, to safe. To yeah, safe I've place. heard you talk about like Pacific Rim, it was the, the girl with the red shoes Absolutely. the tree. You like had to make that movie just it, to see it, that. It, it doesn't matter uh, uh, what you go through, it doesn't matter if they, uh, they give you X amount of time, but you need to always protect the images that are crucial. I used to do makeup effects for my stuff. They were very bad, but I was the only one doing them. So a lot of friends, when I was doing my short films, they would see the effect and say, who did that for you? And I say, I did it. And they started telling me, would you do mine? And I started doing it and I realized it was an edge 
with which going to feature films. And what I did is, for example, uh, we did a TV series called Ora Marcada, which was, again, terrible filmmaking, but we were all learning. Alfonso Cuaron was there, I was there, Emmanuel Lubezki, the DP, Guillermo Navarro, my DP, all of us started in that series. And we were doing little experiments, and I, would, I said to the producers, I'll do the makeup effects for free. You pay the materials, I do them for free, but in exchange, I write and direct episodes. And they said, that's a good deal. So it was a way to put your foot on the door. And I, uh, and I was already on the way to do Kronos. I, I started writing Kronos around 1985. And uh, I knew that in order to make the device, the Kronos device and the makeup effects, I needed to create a company that would tell the producers there's someone that can do those effects. So as soon as I did Kronos, Essentially, a year later, the shop was closed because it had served its purpose. I've never thought of my work or my life as a career. I never. That's why I have f***ed up so many times. And, you know, I want the right to f*** up. And that's the only inalienable right of a human being is to f*** up. And I cherish the screw-ups. So, you know, I'm going to continue f***ing up in the same way I've been f***ing up since the beginning. And that's the only promise of quality I can, I can give you. You're going to get the same sh** from the same guy with the same earnestness. And I'm never going to worry about salary or career or sh** like that. I can't. I'm genetically engineered to do my own thing, you know. And, and that's what, if I had been more malleable, I have never given my version of what happened on Mimic. But I fought and won the war. Lost a lot of battles, but won the war. And it was a very tough war, and it was a very frontal war. And I learned the value of identity in that process. And I tell you, that's the only thing I'm concerned with. I don't, I don't respond to the world. If they say, yeah, we're gonna pay you 10 million to direct uh, an action, a straight action film. Can you imagine that? Waking up every morning and going to shoot a movie that, you know, that's like, you know, not having a boner and going to a sex show every day for work. What do you do? And you're gonna show up and you're gonna, eh. That's it, the same thing. Pan's Labyrinth is a project Del Toro had no problem showing up for. An adult fairy tale with a dark side. I think that the movie uh, comes from a very, very dark, very genuine place in my heart. And I think that sincerity always finds an audience. No matter how small, no matter how large. Is Pan's Labyrinth going to be, you know, is going to make the same money that Little Nemo did? No. But whatever audience it touches, it's going to touch really deeply. Will Pan find People that fall in love with it rabidly in the world? Yes. Will it find people that never understand what the appeal is? Yes. But it's a film that comes from a genuine place. And it has the two things that are absolutely necessary to make film. Balls and heart.